Good evening, everyone. Those of you that are in person, as well as those that are joining us virtually, thank you so much for being here. We are just happy to uh, be back at it again um, and appreciate your patience as we go through uh, all of our events in a safe manner. And we're just thrilled that you're here and we hope you are looking forward to what's coming next as we are. Um, my name is Jennifer Hollowell. I am the Arts Outreach Coordinator here at Tusculum University. And um, we, Brian, Ricker, Frank Mangle, Aaron Schultz and I are part of Arts, Arts Outreach. And uh, this challenging year has been something, but um, we have many things, as I said, coming up that I, I hope you will partake in. Um, so keep your eyes and ears peeled for what's, what's coming up. And you'll hear more about this week here shortly. Um, if I could ask you to silence your phones, I'd appreciate that. Um, also, just to, to uh, follow rules, um, please understand in the very unlikely event of a fire or a situation, there is an exit here to my left, and then you can also um, exit through the doors in which you came. So, um, and at this time, I would like to introduce our president, Dr. Hummel. He's the one that inspired us to do this whole week. Um, and we are thrilled that you did. So thank you, Dr. Hummel. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here and, um, and, and, and for those uh, in person as well as those uh, that are online. Um, when I first uh, uh, came to Tuscaloosa, in fact, even before I came to Tuscaloosa, uh, I um, uh, reached out to, um, to, to Peter Knoll and uh, Dean uh, Thomas uh, about uh, an exhibit that uh, uh, William Carey University was hosting, uh, the, uh, a Shoah exhibit, a Holocaust uh, exhibit, and uh, uh, I inquired about the possibility of, of you know, Tuscaloosa hosting that, and have been uh, very pleased uh, that Tuscaloosa uh, not only just uh, hosted uh, the same or similar exhibit, but really has taken it up uh, several notches. Uh, I, I think it's uh, making it a much better experience that it is uh, uh, preceded by this uh, lecture, very much looking forward to this lecture, uh, that it's also then uh, followed by being able to hear from uh, uh, Andy Starkeny, who uh, is a uh, childhood survivor of the, the Holocaust and I mean, just what a, an incredible experience to be able to hear uh, from a, a, an eyewitness. Uh, and then for the, the theatrical production, the one act, uh, and, and so really the, the synergy of the art coming together, uh, I think makes this uh, uh, an even more meaningful experience. Any one of themselves would be meaningful, but, but really uh, all three coming together, I, I think is, is very important and, and very much appreciate that. Uh, because art, it enables us to be able to kind of express what we cannot express otherwise. Uh, to be able to, the, the, the art of, um, you know, the, of the, the graphics and the image, but the art of the theater, I mean, just, it, it's almost impossible, I think, to really talk about or even read about the Holocaust without art. Uh, art enables us to experience it on an emotional level that we can't just reading in books as valuable uh, as that is. And so I, I'm very appreciative uh, for Dusclin University and, <clears throat> and all of you that have been involved in, in really making this a better, richer, more meaningful experience. Now it is a, an event that is, uh, I mean, a discussion and art and expression that, that is unpleasant, that, that's difficult, it's tragic, it's horrible, and yet it's necessary. Now, um, when uh, I take groups of students or, and others to, to Israel, we always go to Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum uh, in Jerusalem. Not because it's pleasant, not because it's the touristy thing to do, but because it's necessary. Because it's so very important that we remember, and, and not just remember history, not just remember what, what happened, but remember what can still happen. Uh, and, and I think part of what uh, kind of drove it home for me is that uh, years ago, when I was studying at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, doing graduate work, uh, I, I remember sitting on the bus on a number of occasions and uh, somebody coming in and sitting 
across from me or sitting next to me and seeing their, their arm with the number and seeing the tattoo and it clearly made this, this is not just history, this person experienced this and, and it really kind of brought a, a kind of a, a connection that just reading history just, just can't do. It brought a connection that art approximate and art gets us to. And so I'm very appreciative uh, of this. But uh, I uh, thank you for being here. As unpleasant as it is, but as necessary as it is, as we continue to think in the process, because it's also a part of the power of art, not, not just to express, but to be able to transcend the generations. It, it is giving voice to voices that were silenced. It is giving voices, voice to people who uh, have, have gone and have passed away, but their art still remains. Their voice still expresses what has happened. Um, and then, you know, uh, I don't wanna go any, any, any further, but um, I, I wanna just make two, two last things. And, and one is that while at Yad Vashem, um, you also see not only just in the museum, but you, you also see that they have planted trees all around and that the trees were planted in memory and in honor of those who had sacrificed their lives or risked their lives to save Jews in the Holocaust. And specifically, and of course there, there, were, there, were, uh, there were many, but specifically we're highlighting the righteous of the nations, the righteous Gentiles who sacrifice or risk their lives for others. And, and it uh, kind of struck me that in one part of the museum, you, you saw that some people chose to remain silent. Some people chose to actually participate in something unbelievable and horrendous, but that there were other people that chose to risk their lives and to stand up even though it didn't directly affect them, they could have avoided it, but they couldn't stand by as an injustice was happening to anyone else. And it reminds me that this isn't something that just happened, it's something that can happen. And it reminds me that still today, we have a choice. Will we stand by silent? Will we actually participate? Or will we stand up and stand against that injustice even though it does come at a risk and a cost. So I, I thank you for all that you're doing to express this. And so Dean Thomas, if, if you will um, come forward now and uh, thank you particularly for your leadership in, in putting this together and giving me the opportunity to welcome you uh, to this week in this event. sort of expecting people to scream. <laughs> it's like, oh, I forgot what he looks like. That's, that's too bad. Thank you, President Hummel. Someone asked me the other day why we would have you know, an events planned to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Holocaust when our political spectrum is so bleak in the middle of a plague. I think the sentiment was, don't we have enough to worry about? I've, uh, when I was a young person, I'm still young, um, <laughs> but I was involved in a production of I Never Saw Another Butterfly and it was 1991, so about 30 years I've had this interest in studying and learning about Shoah, the Holocaust. And why would we do it now? I can think of four reasons. Certainly, it provides us a perspective that we don't have, right? I mean, it teaches us that our suffering is never the worst. 
It makes us ask questions like, what does it mean to be human and how can these humans treat each other in such ways? And certainly it teaches us the importance of compassion and empathy. And I would suggest that in our own history, this is one of those times that we need to study the Holocaust. But I'm not really here to you know, preach on that. I, I'm, I just want to thank you for coming, and I also want to acknowledge some really integral people who made all of these events happen, and then I want to introduce my friend Desiree. But let me say, where's Jennifer? Jennifer has worked with Tuscaloosa University, what, 50, 60 years? That's right. It's been, it's been a few decades though, right? And I don't think she gets recognized enough. She's the coordinator of arts outreach. And there is nothing that we're doing this week that she's not had a hand in. And I think we all should applaud her. And all of arts outreach, really. There's Frank, he's worked here for a number of times and he's just magnificent in everything that he does. And we appreciate you, Frank. And uh, where's Brian, our coordinator, right? He's the director of the play. Oh, I stuck my head in there. You know, I listened to, I'm in the same building, so I got to listen to some of them rehearsing and it just brought back so many memories and made me chilled, you know, like I just, I got tingly and whatnot, and I, 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 I'm convinced that this production will change their lives very much like it changed mine. I'm very much looking forward to Brian and Frank um, and all of Arts Outreach, Arts Outreach, Lisa Andrews. Without, uh, without Lisa, there's no way the event with our alum would have happened. And I really dearly appreciate that, Lisa, and everything that you did to help make that a go. And, uh, uh, Peter, where's Peter? Peter Knoll, he sort of oversaw the coordination of the show exhibition, really. From the get-go, he, 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 he was inspired, and he had instincts, and I thought, we just need to turn him loose. And when you see this exhibition, oh, wow, right? It's, you're you're going to be blown away just in its beauty. I know that sounds strange, but it's beautiful. And all, we trusted Pete's instincts, and I think that we were right to do that, and I appreciate tremendously all the hard work that he put into that. I want to say thanks to Bill for helping Pete, um, and Bill's students, where's Bill's students, and Lana's students, and Peter's students, and, and I want to say a big, where's Lana? Boy, Lana, I'm so sorry. I feel like everything that I need something done, I have to turn to Lana this, this semester. She doesn't complain, but I can tell she's getting tired of answering my phone calls. Lana, I appreciate you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, and now I'll introduce, I hope I haven't forgotten everybody. You're also very wonderful, and thank you all for coming. Now I want to introduce my friend Desiree. I kind of have something that I wrote up, and then I thought I would read her formal bio because I want everybody to understand that when we have a Cicero lecturer, this is the real deal, right? This means this is a scholar teacher that could be at any university in the country and, and be, you know, asked to do this, right? She's quite amazing. Let me explain to you why. It's hard to believe I've known Desiree Matherly as a friend and colleague for more than a decade now. I've only known her to be a devoted teacher and mentor, an engaged scholar, a thoughtful and effective academic leader, and collegially enthusiastic and uplifting. She is a source of inspiration for me, and she is one of the best friends that I have. I, from time to time, visited Desiree's classes to observe her teaching. She is consistently on point malleable yet firm in her expectations. She motivates students' excitements while also challenging them to dig deeper, to think better, and to say aloud, if not loudly, the newness of their understandings. 
Desi's scholarship is impressive. Without fail, every single year since she started at Tusculum, she has published essays and presented her research at national or international conferences. She has won several national and international prizes for her writing, and she has recently, and she was recently shortlisted for the Fulbright. In my former, former capacity as editor of the Tusculum Review, I worked five years with Desiree in her capacity as our journal's nonfiction editor. I have a graduate degree with an emphasis in nonfiction writing myself, and I can tell you honestly that I've not met anyone with a more nuanced understanding of the history, trends, and contemporary requirements of the, of the genre than her, and that includes myself and my teachers. Desi has been active with her service to Tusculum University. She served on our Institutional Re Review Board and as chair of our Programs and Policies Committee, which is now the Undergraduate Committee Curricula, Curricula Committee. She is the Department Chair of English and Fine Arts. Always in her work, she's consistent, meditative, cheerful, and effective. She has incredible energies and a nonstop refreshing idealism that is tempered only enough to accomplish what needs doing. It is for these reasons that Desi was an obvious choice to deliver this year's Cicero lecture, an annual recognition at a that, of a Tusculum family member whose works in scholarship and teaching have been deemed exceptional. And now for the more formal part of the bio. Just listen to this. A native of East Tennessee, Desiree Matherly attended David Crockett High School and went on to study English and philosophy at East Tennessee State University. She earned an MA in creative writing from Ohio University and spent one year studying philosophy before earning a PhD in nonfiction with a specialization in essays, memoir, and autobiography. After serving as a postdoctoral fellow at Ohio, at Ohio University, Matherly went on to the University of Chicago where she taught in the humanities vision as a Harper Fellow and a collegiate assistant professor. Matherly joined Tusculum's English faculty in 2009 as the coordinator of the journalism professional writing concentration. At the time, she assumed the role of nonfiction editor for the Tusculum Review, a literary magazine produced by Tusculum's creative writing students, which publishes established and emerging writers from the United States and abroad. In 2018, Matherly was appointed Chair of English and Fine Arts, continuing to teach courses in nonfiction, poetry, sci science fiction, philosophy, and composition. Her essays have been anthologized in After Montaigne. Did I say that right? Okay. Contemporary writers cover the essays, Red Holler and Anthology of Contemporary Appalachian Literature and the Best Creative Nonfiction, Volume 2. For her published essays, four of her published essays have made the notable list and best American essays, and she has long listed for the prestigious Notting Hill Editor's Essay Prize. Her recent writing appears in Hotel America, Essay, and Fourth Genre, and she is the winner of the 2008 Kurt Johnson Prose Award in Nonfiction, sponsored by December Magazine. In 2019, her short story won the Owl Canyon Press Hackathon, and she is judging that, year, that, that contest this year. Matherly is the author of Echoes Fugue, a collection of personal essays published by Mad Creek Books, which is an imprint of Ohio State University Press, published just last year. Her current projects include a young adult novel set in the bleak future of climate change, and an essay on human evil she has been working on for over a decade. It is for these reasons, these many reasons, that Desi was an obvious choice to deliver, to deliver this year's Cicero lecture, an annual recognition of a Tusculum family member whose work is scholarship and teaching has been deemed exceptional. Please help me in inviting her to the stage.
Okay, who else is masked? Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, that was really a little too much there, Wayne, but I appreciate it. Um, I uh, felt myself shrinking down in my seat. That was a really grand introduction. Um, right now, I'm trying to find the screen here and share it. And this is the sort of thing that we all are going through right now when we're teaching our classes is getting the technology running so that we can actually do the things that are more familiar. So I think we're, we're good. Let me look one more thing. Okay, we're unmuted and projectors going. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it, it, a lot of people came together to make this week happen. And I'm so thankful that you, you went through everyone's names and, and just talked about what they're contributing this week. I'm so happy to be a part of this. I really didn't think it would lead to a lecture. I just remember when I found out that uh, President Hummel was wanting to do something uh, regarding or surrounding the, the Shoah, I told Wayne, I said, I, I want to be involved. And at that point, I had no idea what that could entail. So this is, this is the, um, this is where that ended. So uh, again, thank you for being here. As has already been mentioned, I mean, you have a lot of choices about what you could do. And at a time like this, it might be a lot easier to stay at home, watch a comedy on Netflix and try to just unwind. And especially we're at midterm. I know students have been under a huge amount of stress as have their professors and we, uh, but we're still going and we're, we're, we're uh, here we are week eight, week eight, which nobody thought that we'd actually be here. And that's a spectacular thing. So you're here and you chose to confront Auschwitz, the iconic symbol of the Holocaust. And I feel that I'm trying to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. It worked. Okay. So I'd like to begin with an invocation of sorts, perhaps to that muse of memory and remembrance, Namasani, mother of the nine muses who guides all of the arts, literature, and poetry, but more specifically to Charlotte Delbo, a French woman who was arrested for her work with the French resistance, survived Auschwitz, and was a moral witness to what transpired there. The poem gives us our title for tonight's lecture, and is the first we encounter in None of Us Will Return, called Street for Arrivals, Street for Departures. And if you have access to a computer, if you're on Zoom, uh, you can uh, just Google Charlotte Delbo, a station without a name. And it, this should come as, up as one of the first results. It's the translation by John Githens, which appeared in 1968. And uh, just to give you a little bit of overview of what I'm going to do, since there are four memoirs um, I guess you could classify Delbo's work as a memoir, though I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. It's a little complicated. It's sort of like a, a collective sort of uh, memoir. Um, I want to give over at least 10 minutes or so to each of the writers that I'm speaking about tonight. So even though there will be a lecture component where I'm talking and offering some commentary or background or context, there will be at least four segments where I will be reading directly from the, the actual work of the author. And I think that we should give them that respect. That's, that's really um, what I feel most comfortable with. Okay, so I'll start reading. So this is Charlotte Delbo, Street for Arrivals, Street for Departures. There are people arriving. They scan the crowd of those who wait, seeking those who wait for them. They kiss them and they say that they are tired from the journey. There are people leaving. They say goodbye to those who are not leaving and they kiss the children. There is a street for people arriving and a street for people leaving. There is a cafe called Arrivals and a cafe called Departures. There are people arriving and there are people leaving. But there is a station where those arriving are the same as those leaving, a station at which those arriving have never arrived. 
to which those leaving have never returned. It is the biggest station in the world. This is the station at which they arrive, wherever they come from. They arrive here after days and nights, after crossing whole countries. They arrive here with children, even babies who were not supposed to have been taken. They have brought their children because you do not part with children for this journey. Those who had gold brought it along because they thought that gold might be useful. Everyone brought his dearest possession because you must not leave what is dear to you when you go far away. Everyone has brought his life along. Above all, it was his life that he had to bring along. And when they arrive, they think they have arrived in hell, possibly. Still, they did not believe it. They did not know that you could take a train to hell. But since they are here, they steel themselves and feel ready to face it with women, children, aged parents, with family keepsakes and family documents. They do not know that you do not arrive at that station. They expect the worst. They do not expect the unthinkable. And when the soldiers shout to them to line up by fives, men on one side, women and children on the other, in a language they do not understand, they understand the blows of the truncheons and line up by fives since they are all ready. They are ready for anything. Mothers clutch their children. They shudder at the thought that the children might be taken away from them because the children are hungry and thirsty and crumpled from not having slept across so many lands. At long last, they are arriving. They will be able to take care of them. And when the soldiers shout to them to leave bundles and blankets and keepsakes on the platform, they leave them because they ought to be ready for anything and do not wish to be surprised at anything. They say, we'll see. They have already seen so much and they are tired from the journey. The station is not a station. It is the end of a line. They look and they are stricken by the desolation about them. In the morning, fog hides the marshes. In the evening, spotlights illuminate the white barbed wire fences with the sharpness of stellar photography. They believe that this is where they are being taken and they are terrified. At night, they wait for daylight with the children weighing down their mother's arms, wait and wonder. In the daytime, they do not wait. The lines start moving right away. Women and children first, they are the most weary the men next. They're also weary but relieved that wives and children are being taken care of first, for the women and children always go first. In the winter, they are gripped by the cold, especially those who come from Crete. Snow is new to them. In the summer, the sun blinds them as they step down from the dark boxcars that were sealed shut at the start of the journey. At the start of the journey from France, from the Ukraine, from Albania, from Belgium, from Slovakia, from Italy, from Hungary, from the Peloponnesus, from Holland, from Macedonia, from Austria, from Herzegovina, from the shores of the Black Sea, from the shores of the Baltic, from the shores of the Mediterranean, and from the banks of the Vistula. They would like to know where they are. They do not know that this is the center of Europe. They look for the name of the station. It is a station without a name, a station which for them will never have a name. There are some who are traveling for the first time in their lives. There are some who have traveled to every part of the globe, businessmen. All landscapes were familiar to them, but they do not recognize this one. They look. Later on, they will be able to tell how it was. Everyone wants to recall what his impression was and how he had the feeling that he would never return. It is a feeling one might have had already in one's life. They know feelings should not be trusted. There are those who come from Warsaw with big shawls and knotted bundles, those who come from Zagreb, women with kerchiefs on their heads, those who come from the Danube with garments knitted by the hearth and multicolored yarns, those who come from Greece bringing black olives and Turkish delight, those who come from Monte Carlo, they were in the casino, they, were, they are in white tie with shirt fronts that the journey has completely ruined. 
pot-bellied and bald. They are bankers who played at banking, newlyweds who were leaving the synagogue with the bride dressed in white, wearing a veil all wrinkled from lying on the floor of the boxcar, the bridegroom dressed in black and top hat with soiled gloves, the relatives and guests, women with beaded bags who all regret that they were not able to stop off at their homes and change into something less fragile. The rabbi holds his head up high and walks first, he has always set an example for the others. There are little girls from boarding school with their identical pleated skirts and their hats with blue streamers. They pull up their stockings carefully as they alight. They walk demurely five by five as though on a Thursday outing, holding one another by the hand and not knowing. What can they do to little girls from boarding school who are with their teacher? The teacher tells them, you good children. They have no wish not to be good. There are old people who have had news from their children in America. Their knowledge of foreign lands came from postcards. Nothing looked like what they see here. Their children will never believe it. There are intellectuals, doctors or architects, composers or poets, recognizable by their walk, by their glasses. They too have seen a great deal in their lifetimes. They have studied a lot. Some have even imagined a great deal in order to write books and nothing they have ever imagined resembles what they see here. There are all the furriers of the big cities and all the gentlemen and ladies tailors, all the clothiers who had immigrated to the West and who do not recognize in this place the land of their forebears. There are the inexhaustible multitudes of the cities where each man occupies his own pigeonhole and now in this place they form endless lines and you wonder how all that could fit into the stacked pigeonholes of the cities. There is a mother who slaps her five-year-old because he does not want to give her his hand and because she wants him to keep still at her side. You run the risk of getting lost. You must not become separated in a strange place in such a crowd. She slaps her child and we who know do not forgive her for it. Besides, it would make no difference Lady if is she reading were a book, to smother bro. him with kisses. There are those who journeyed 18 days who went mad and killed one another in the boxcars and those who had been suffocated during the journey because they had been packed in so tightly. Of course, they do not get off. There is a little girl who hugs her doll to her heart. You can smother dolls too. There are two sisters in white coats who went out for a walk and did not return for dinner. Their parents are still worrying. In ranks of five, they move along the street for arrivals. They do not know it is the street for departures. You only pass this way once. They move in strict order so that you cannot fault them for anything. They come to a building and they sigh. At last they have arrived. And when the soldiers shout to the women to strip, they undress the children first, taking care not to wake them up completely. After days and nights of travel, they are fretful and cross and they begin to get undressed in front of their children. It can't be helped. And when the soldiers hand each one of them a towel, they worry if the water in the shower will be warm because the children might catch cold. And when the men come into the shower room through another door naked too, the women hide their children against their bodies and then perhaps they understand. And it is useless for them to understand now, since they cannot tell those who are waiting on the platform, cannot tell those who are riding in the dark, dark boxcars across all the count countries on the way here, cannot tell those who are in detention camps and are apprehensive about their departure because they fear the climate or the work and because they are afraid of leaving their belongings, cannot tell those who are in hiding in the mountains and in the woods and who no longer have the patience to stay in hiding, Come what may, they will return to their homes. Why would they be taken away from their homes? They have never done any harm to anyone. Cannot tell those who did not want to go into hiding because you cannot go and leave everything. Cannot tell those who thought they had put their children in a safe place in a Catholic boarding school where the sisters are so kind. A band will be dressed in the little girl's pleated skirts. The commandant wants Viennese waltzes on Sunday mornings. A blakova to give her window a homey touch will make curtains out of the holy cloth the rabbi wore so that he would be ready to perform services no matter what happened wherever he might be. A capo will dress up in the morning coat and top hat and her girlfriend in the veil and they will play bride and groom at night when the others have collapsed in their bunks from exhaustion. The capos can have a good time, they are not tired in the evening. 
Black Olives and Turkish Delight will be distributed to the German women prisoners who are sick, but they do not like Kalamata olives, nor olives in general. And all day and all night, every day and every night, the chimneys smoke with this fuel from all the countries of Europe. Men assigned to the chimneys spend their days sifting the ashes to recover melted gold from gold teeth. They all have gold in their mouths, these Jews, and they are so many that it makes tons. And in the spring, men and women spread the ashes on the marshes, drained and plowed for the first time, and fertilize the soil with human phosphate. They have bags tied to their bellies, and they stick their hands into the human bone meal, which they scatter by the handful over the furrows with the wind blowing the dust back into their faces. In the evening, they are all white with lines traced by the sweat that has trickled down over the dust. And no fear of running short, train after train arrives. They arrive every day, every night, every hour of every day and every hour of every night. It is the biggest railway station in the world for arrivals and departures. It is only those who go into the camp who find out what has happened to the others and who weep at having left them at the station because that day the officer ordered the younger people to form a separate line. There has to be someone to drain the marshes and to scatter the ashes of the others. And they say to themselves that it would have been better never to have entered and never to have found out. Charlotte Del Beau was deeply involved in theater and a playwright, so it makes sense that she would begin by describing the setting of the events she describes in her trilogy, Auschwitz and After. Composed of three books, each written and published at separate times, the first is chillingly titled, None of Us Will Return, from which the preceding poem was taken. Her work is not a straightforward personal narrative, but a collective account of the 230 French women who arrived together at Auschwitz and of whom only 49 survived. If we ask the question, why Auschwitz? It is because this was where Charlotte Zobo first arrived after being transferred from a prison in France where she had lived for almost a year. If we ask in a much larger way, why Auschwitz? We're really wanting to know why this particular camp has become the iconic symbol of the Holocaust. Auschwitz was the largest system with several camps included within its complex and 44 more subcamps. Located in Nazi occupied Poland, it was centrally positioned in Europe, so people of every nationality were within reach by rail, and the trains came from every part of the continent. Poland at one time had the highest concentration of Jewish people in Europe, and after the war, 90% of that Jewish population were completely gone. And you can see from this image just how central Auschwitz is to the rest of Europe. Auschwitz is also famous because it was the only camp to tattoo prisoners on their left arm with a number which could be used to identify which transport they arrived with and how many people had been tattooed before them. Auschwitz was unique because it was a concentration camp which provided slave labor to the region and area factories, but also was an extermination camp with gas chambers and multiple crematoriums. When Charlotte Del Beau describes the human bone meal that was scattered on the marshes as fertilizer, we are to understand that the bones that did not burn were ground to powder to be scattered, which also served the grim purpose of destroying the evidence of the 1.1 million people, most of whom were Jewish, who died at that particular camp. In mid-January 1945, when it was likely that the Red Army would soon be there, the camp began an evacuation, forcing 60,000 prisoners to march westward. As many as 15,000 prisoners died during the evacuation marches. And if you read Elie Wiesel's Night, there is a description. Uh, he and his father were a part of that evacuation. Prisoners who were too weak to march, 6,000 of the sick and dying stayed at Auschwitz until it was liberated by the Soviets on January the 27th, 1945. And in 2005, the United Nations General Assembly named January the 27th, International Holocaust Remembrance Day to honor the six million, six million Jewish dead and the millions of other European peoples the Nazis targeted for elimination. 
I'm going to stop for just a second and say that something I, I neglected to put into this lecture was the uh, horrifying statistics of people who don't know, have never heard of Auschwitz, uh, don't really know that much about the Holocaust. And what's worse is that many of them are younger people. And it's, uh, I, you know, I could pull these statistics up for you, uh, but if you just email me, I will send you, I will send you that, that report. But uh, one of the, one of the statistical facts that people seem confused about is the number of dead we're talking about and six million Jewish people and 10 million, I think, other assorted groups. Um, but many people are wrong. They think it was less than 2 million people died in the Holocaust when at Auschwitz alone, that was 1.1 million people. So when we think of the numbers of people, camps, murders, mass graves, train cars packed with human beings, gas chambers, the starved corpses, it is easy to be overwhelmed. It is also easy to make comparisons to a larger human past, which includes countless other events we could properly call genocides and atrocities. The Spanish Inquisition, the European conquest of the Americas, the enslavement of millions of Africans, the massacre of Armenians, but the Holocaust happened within the lifetimes of many people still living, and some of those persons are themselves survivors, and therefore capable of speaking about the events from a personal perspective. Those who assume their role as moral witnesses relate their accounts so that the memory of what happened is not lost. And given the uniqueness of the Holocaust, among past examples of human evil on earth, there is an imperative to make sure that it does not happen again. The Holocaust was an attempt to not only eliminate the people the Nazis considered dangerous or unfit, but to utterly eliminate the Jewish people and their culture from existence and from memory so that no one would be able to tell the story of what happened to future generations. This is why they murdered women and children without hesitation and why they had prisoners at Treblinka, another Polish camp, exhume the bodies from mass graves and burn them, grind their bones into powder and distribute the ashes on the fields. Now, this is actually um, a secret photo that was taken at Auschwitz by one of the Sonderkommando units that were um, the people who took the bodies from the gas chambers and to the crematoriums and handled, handled them. Um, but Treblinka, if you really want to hear uh, a personal account of that, just watch the first hour of Shoah. Uh, the, uh, the film is about like nine and a half hours long. I'll mention it in a moment, but uh, directed by Claude Lonsman. This is why toward the end of the war, prisoners at Auschwitz were driven on death marches toward Germany just prior to liberation. The magnitude of the crimes that the Nazis committed was beyond what much of the world had known or could imagine. So it was an attempt to unmake, undo, and utterly destroy Jewishness. This is why many people call the Holocaust the Shoah, and why remembering is an imperative. So a little etymology. The word Holocaust comes from the Greek word holocauston, which is a translation of the Hebrew word ola, meaning burnt sacrifice, and is the more familiar term for most English speakers. Shoah. Hebrew for catastrophe or disaster more specifically describes the Nazis' attempt to entirely annihilate the Jewish people and all evidence that they had ever existed. What term we use may vary, but Holocaust and international law scholar David M. Crow offers some clarity in his introduction to his 2008 work, The Holocaust, Roots, History, and Aftermath. And I quote, in the end, questions of Holocaust breadth and definition are less important than those of personal losses and victimization. The Holocaust is about people, victims and perpetrators. And the search for clues to understanding this indescribable tragedy is important not to get so caught up in definitions and statistics that one loses sight of the terrible human losses that occurred in Europe from 1933 to 1945. So it's really this focus on the, the individual, the, the person who is affected think that um, is being urged here. 
So I first heard the word Shoah in my first year of graduate school, and up until that point, I'd, I'd only heard the word Holocaust. Um, in public school, we read selections from Anne Frank's diary, but I don't remember learning about what happened to her afterward, that she was deported to Auschwitz and died in Bergen-Belsen, most likely of typhus. In a 1997 article from The New Yorker titled Who Owns Anne Frank's, writer Cynthia Ozick raises two points that I cannot really put aside very easily right now as a mature reader, and I mean as an adult. Ozick writes that to come to the diary without having earlier assimilated Elie Wiesel's Night and Primo Levi's The Drowned and the Saved, which is an essay in uh, Survival and Auschwitz, which I'll talk about in a moment, is to allow oneself to stew in an implausible and ugly innocence. It's really striking words, but there are a lot of school children who their only real serious or deep encounter with the Holocaust might be the diary of Anne Frank. And, and there might be more that they need to experience or be introduced to here is, I think, what's being suggested. Later in the essay, uh, Ozick points to yet another drawback of reading the diary um, without having that, that deeper connection to what happened in the camps and absent from the full historical context. This is a, another striking quote. Sanctified and absolving, shorn of darkness, Anne Frank remains in all countries, a revered and comforting figure in the contemporary mind. And I think the idea is that we should not be comforted. Another potentially problematic introduction for some to the Holocaust is the first portion of Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, entitled experiences in a concentration camp, preceding the second portion of the book, which presents an existential psychotherapeutic method called logotherapy. I found an older edition of Man's Search for Meaning in a used bookstore when I was in high school and quickly found that it was the kind of book I wanted to read. It was philosophical and deep, and it made an intense argument on the behalf of survival through finding meaning in our own suffering. According to Frankel, Psychological observations of the prisoners have shown that only the men who allowed their inner hold on their moral and spiritual selves to subside eventually fell victim to the camp's degenerating influences. However, Holocaust scholars have pointed to this as blaming the Jewish victims who didn't survive for their negative attitudes. This is one among many disconcerting aspects of Frankl's narrative in addition to the fact that much of his work seems to take place in Auschwitz when Frankel spent no more than three days there. In reality, his account is of the six months he spent in Kalfri near Dachau in southern Germany, though this is not directly mentioned in the book itself. Although in 1991, Man's Search for Meaning was listed as, quote, one of the 10 most influential books in the U.S., by the Library of Congress and is recommended as one of Amazon's top 100 books to read in a lifetime. At the time of a late 1990s interview, none of his works had ever been on sale in the bookstore of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. Although I, I recently reread Frankel and found his work as profound as he seemed to me 30 years ago, I'm curious about his choices to describe in detail some parts of his experience and to be less specific in other ways. What I find interesting now as a reader is how he often uses third person and then shifts into first person. As a reader of nonfiction, I have I've always been more alert to the first person story, the I of the witness. Frankel was the head of the neurology department at the Vienna Rothschild Hospital before he and his family were resettled in Theresienstadt, which was part of a con part concentration camp, part ghetto, but largely a deception on the part of the Nazis claiming resettlement for older and well-to-do Jewish people. His father died of starvation there, and after two years of increasingly crowded and inhumane conditions, Frankel's family were deported to Auschwitz. His mother and brother both died in the gas chambers there, and his wife died later at Bergen-Belsen before it was liberated. So even if critics of his work may argue that his short stay in Auschwitz 
harms his credibility when speaking about the camp, I think a few days would have been enough for him to have lost all that he most loved and to understand the horrors of that camp. He was transferred after Auschwitz to Kaufring, another concentration camp. So his experience is that of a survivor, whatever other questions we might put to his work. Because of the immense popularity of Frankl's book for millions of readers, and because it was the first narrative I ever read by a survivor, I want to read a brief section which describes life in the camp and the apathy, uh, which he considered a part of the second phase of a prisoner's experience after the initial shock. This will be a little bit shorter than the um, Charlotte Delbo. So this is Victor Frankl. Apathy, the main symptom of the second phase, was a necessary mechanism of self-defense. Reality dimmed, and all efforts and all emotions were centered on one task, preserving one's own life and that of the other fellow. It was typical to hear the prisoners, while they were being herded back to camp from their work sites in the evening, sigh with relief and say, well, another day is over. It can be readily understood that such a state of strain coupled with the constant necessity of concentrating on the task of staying alive, forced the prisoner's inner life down to a primitive level. Several of my colleagues in camp who were trained in psychoanalysis often spoke of a regression in the camp inmate, a retreat to a more primitive form of mental life. His wishes and desires became obvious in his dreams. What did the prisoner dream about most frequently? Of bread, cake, cigarettes and nice warm baths. The lack of having these simple desires satisfied led him to seek wish fulfillment in dreams. Whether these dreams did any good is another matter. The dreamer had to wake from them to the reality of camp life and to the terrible contrast between that and his dream illusions. I shall never forget how I was roused one night by the groans of a fellow prisoner who threw himself about in his sleep, obviously having a horrible nightmare. Since I had always been especially sorry for people who suffered from fearful dreams or deliria, I wanted to wake the poor man. Suddenly I drew back the hand which was ready to shake him, frightened at the thing I was about to do. At that moment, I became intensely conscious of the fact that no dream, no matter how horrible, could be as bad as the reality of the camp which surrounded us and to which I was about to recall him. Because of the high degree of undernourishment which the prisoners suffered, it was natural that the desire for food was the major primitive instinct around which mental life centered. Let us observe the majority of prisoners when they happened to work near each other and were, for once, not closely watched. They would immediately start discussing food. One fellow would ask another working next to him in the ditch what his favorite dishes were. Then they would exchange recipes and plan the menu for the day when they would have a reunion, the day in a distant future when they would be liberated and returned home. They would go on and on, picturing it all in detail until suddenly a warning was passed down the trench, usually in the form of a special password or number. The guard is coming. I always regarded the discussions about food as dangerous. Is it not wrong to provoke the organism with such detailed and effective pictures of delicacies when it has somehow managed to adapt itself to extremely small rations and low calories. Though it may afford momentary psychological relief, it is an illusion which physiologically surely must not be without danger. During the latter part of our imprisonment, the daily ration consisted of very watery soup given out once daily and the usual small bread ration. In addition to that, there was the so-called extra allowance consisting of three-fourths of an ounce of margarine, or of a slice of poor quality sausage, or of a little piece of cheese, or a bit of synthetic honey, or a spoonful of watery jam, varying daily. In calories, this diet was absolutely inadequate, especially taking into consideration our heavy manual work and our constant exposure to the cold in inadequate clothing. The sick who were under special care, that is, those who were allowed to lie in the huts instead of leaving the camp for work, were even worse off. When the last layers of subcutaneous fat had vanished and we looked like skeletons disguised with skin and rags, we could watch our bodies beginning to devour themselves. The organism digested its own protein and the muscles disappeared. Then the body had no powers of resistance left. One after another, the members of the little community in our hut died. Each of us could calculate with fair accuracy whose turn would be next 
and when his own would come. After many observations, we knew the symptoms well, which made the correctness of our prognosis, pro, prognoses quite certain. He won't last long, or this is the next one, we whispered to each other. And when, during our daily search for lice, we saw our own naked bodies in the evening, we thought alike. This body here, my body, is really a corpse already. What has become of me? I am but a small portion of a great mass of human flesh, of a mass behind barbed wire, crowded into a few earthen huts, a mass of which daily a certain portion begins to rot because it has become lifeless. I mentioned above how unavoidable were the thoughts about food and favorite dishes which forced themselves into the consciousness of the prisoner whenever he had a moment to spare. Perhaps it can be understood then that even the strongest of us was longing for the time when he would have fairly good food again, not for the sake of good food itself, but for the sake of knowing that the subhuman existence, which had made us unable to think of anything other than food, would at last cease. Those who have not gone through a similar experience can hardly conceive of the soul-destroying mental conflicts and clashes of willpower which a famished man experiences. They can hardly grasp what it means to stand digging in a trench, listening only for the siren to announce 9.30 or 10 a.m., the half-hour lunch interval, when bread would be rationed out as long as it was still available, repeatedly asking the foreman if he wasn't a disagreeable fellow, what the time was, and tenderly touching a piece of bread in one's coat pocket, first stroking it with frozen gloveless fingers, then breaking off a crumb and putting it in one's mouth, and finally, with the last bit of willpower, pocketing it again, having promised oneself that morning to hold out till afternoon. We could hold endless debates on the sense or nonsense of certain methods of dealing with the small bread ration which was given out only once daily during the latter part of our confinement. There were two schools of thought. One was in favor of eating up the ration immediately. This had the twofold advantage of satisfying the worst hunger pangs for a very short time, at least once a day, and of safeguarding against possible theft or loss of the ration. The second group, which held with dividing the ration up, used different arguments. I finally joined their ranks. The most ghastly moment of the 24 hours of camp life was the awakening when, at a still nocturnal hour, the three shrill blows of a whistle tore us piteously from our exhausted sleep and from the longings in our dreams. We then began the tussle with our wet shoes into which we could scarcely force our feet which were sore and swollen with edema. And there were the usual moans and groans about petty troubles such as the snapping of wires which replaced shoelaces. One morning, I heard someone whom I knew to be brave and dignified cry like a child because he finally had to go to the snowy marching grounds in his bare feet as his shoes were too shrunken for him to wear. In those ghastly minutes, I found a little bit of comfort, a small piece of bread which I drew out of my pocket and munched with absorbed delight. Growing up during a time when the Holocaust was rapidly becoming the defining moment of the 20th century meant that there was suddenly an access to new stories. Many of them imagined or only loosely based on the experiences of those who had actually lived through it. In the 80s and 90s, there were many books and films about the Holocaust that I recall reading or watching, but none of them were authoritative or scholarly. William Styron's novel, Sophie's Choice, and the film by the same name starring Meryl Streep, British television film, Escape from Sobibor, Spielberg's landmark film, Schindler's List, and Claude Lelouch's incredible adaptation of Le Miserable set in Nazi-occupied France. These were powerful stories, but fictions nonetheless. In the first graduate workshop I took that year in nonfiction, so this is about 1999, it was probably something like that. We read Primo Levi's Survival in Auschwitz and Elie Wiesel's Night. We watched a good portion of Claude Landsman's film, Shoah, the over nine hour documentary of interviews with those who had survived, witnessed, or participated in the genocide, 
and you can find this on YouTube. In fact, that's been the only way that I can track it down. And uh, just, yeah, I mean, just gear up. These stories told by survivors are accurate, honest, and rich with detail in ways that the fictions could never be. At the same time I was learning what nonfiction was, I was also learning about scholarship, documentation, and criticism. Reading memoirs and essays by survivors or watching video footage of personal accounts puts us closer to the particular personal histories of the lives of others. We might ask about who endured in the camps and what we stand to learn, how we learn from their personal accounts. Concerns regarding style may emerge along with awareness of the complications posed by self-representation. Also, we arrive at the possibility that certain stories lead us more rapidly and more deeply into empathy than others. Elie Wiesel was only 15 when he and his family arrived in Auschwitz sometime in May or June of 1944. His mother and younger sister were sent immediately to the gas chambers, but he and his father were sent to the right into the camp to labor. His book, Night, chronicles his time in Auschwitz and Buchenwald, where he was eventually liberated by the 6th Armored Division of the U.S. Army in April 1945. Wiesel struggles with his faith in Night, and at every point when reading his account, we are reminded of his youth and the incomprehensible hell of Auschwitz. In just a few pages, Wiesel is able to take the reader through the process by which the men are broken down into prisoners. I want to read to you now, beginning with an often quoted passage that propels us rapidly into the darkness of his new world. So this is a very famous, uh, this begins with a very famous portion. And by the way, he was a Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Peace Prize winner. So he has uh, definitely been an influential voice in Holocaust literature and Holocaust, Holocaust studies. Never shall I forget that night, the worst, the first night in camp that turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams into ashes. Never shall I forget those things, even were I condemned so condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. The barrack we had been assigned to was very long. On the roof, a few bluish skylights. I thought, this is what the antechamber of hell must look like. So many crazed men, so much shouting, so much brutality. Dozens of inmates were there to receive us, sticks in hand, striking anywhere, anyone, without reason. The orders came, strip, hurry up, rouse. Hold on only to your belt and your shoes. Our clothes were to be thrown on the floor at the back of the barrack. There was a pile there already, new suits, old ones, torn overcoats, rags. For us, it meant true equality, nakedness. We trembled in the cold. A few SS officers wandered through the room looking for strong men. If vigor was that appreciated, perhaps one should try to appear sturdy. My father thought the opposite, better not to draw attention. We later found out that he had been right. Those who were selected that day were incorporated into the Zonderkommando, the commando working in the crematoria. Billy Katz, the son of an important merchant of my town, had arrived in Birkenau with the first transport one week ahead of us. When he found out that we were there, he succeeded in slipping us a note. He told us that having been chosen because of his strength, he had been forced to place his own father's body into the furnace. The blows continued to rain on us. To the barber. Belt and shoes in hand, I let myself be dragged along to the barbers. Their clippers tore out our hair, shaved every hair on our bodies. My head was buzzing, the same thought surfacing over and over, not to be separated from my father. Freed from the barber's clutches, we began to wander about the crowd, 
finding friends, acquaintances. Every encounter filled us with joy. Yes, joy. Thank God you are still alive. Some were crying. They used whatever strength they had left to cry. Why had they let themselves be brought here? Why didn't they die in their beds? Their words were interspersed with sobs. Suddenly, someone threw his arms around me in a hug. Yahiel, the Saiter, Rebbe's brother, he was weeping bitterly. I thought he was crying with joy at still being alive. Don't cry, Yahiel, I said. Don't waste your tears. Not cry? We're on the threshold of death. Soon we shall be inside. Do you understand? Inside. How could I not cry? I watched darkness fade through the bluish skylights and the roof. I no longer was afraid. I was overcome by fatigue. The absent no longer entered our thoughts. One spoke of them, who knows what happened to them, but their fate was not on our minds. We were incapable of thinking. Our senses were numbed. Everything was fading into a fog. We no longer clung to anything. The instincts of self-preservation, of self-defense, of pride had all deserted us. In one terrifying moment of lucidity, I thought of us as damned souls wandering through the void, souls condemned to wander through space until the end of time, seeking redemption, seeking oblivion, without any hope of finding either. Around five o'clock in the morning, we were expelled from the barrack. The capos were beating us again, but I no longer felt the pain. A glacial wind was enveloping us. We were naked, holding our shoes and belts in order. Run! And we ran. After a few minutes of running, a new barrack, a barrel of foul-smelling liquid stood by the door. Disinfection. Everybody soaked in it. Then came a hot shower, all very fast. As we left the showers, we were chased outside in order to run some more. Another barrack, the storeroom. Very long tables, mountains of prison garb. As we ran, they threw the clothes at us, pants, jackets, shirts. In a few seconds, we had ceased to be men. Had the situation not been so tragic, we might have laughed. We looked pretty strange. Marquette's, a colossus, wore child's pants and stern. A skinny little fellow was floundering in a huge jacket. We immediately started to switch. I glanced over at my father, how changed he looked. His eyes were veiled. I wanted to tell him something, but I didn't know what. The night had passed completely. The morning star shone in the sky. I too had become a different person. The student of Talmud, the child I was, had been consumed by the flames. All that was left was a shape that resembled me. My soul had been invaded and devoured by a black flame. So many events had taken place in just a few hours that I had completely lost all notion of time. When had we left our homes and the ghetto and the train? Only a week ago, one night, one single night? How long had we been standing in the freezing wind? One hour, a single hour, 60 minutes? Surely it was a dream. Not far from us, prisoners were at work. Some were digging holes, others were carrying sand. None as much as glanced at us. We were withered trees in the heart of the desert. Behind me, people were talking. I had no desire to listen to what they were saying or to know what was, who was speaking and what about. Nobody dared raise his voice, even though there was no guard around. We whispered, perhaps because of the thick smoke that poisoned the air and stung the throat. We were herded into yet another barrack inside the gypsy camp. We fell into ranks of five. And now stop moving. There was no floor, a roof and four walls. Our feet sank into the mud. Again, the waiting. I fell asleep standing up. I dreamed of a bed, of my mother's hand on my face. I woke. I was standing, my feet in the mud. Some people collapsed, sliding into the mud, and others shouted, are you crazy? We were told to stand. Do you want to get us all in trouble? As if all the troubles in the world were not already upon us. Little by little, we all sat down in the mud, but we had to get up whenever a capo came in to check if by chance somebody had a new pair of shoes, and if so, we had to hand them over. No use protesting. The blows multiplied, and in the end, one still had to hand them over. I had new shoes myself. But as they were covered with a thick coat of mud, they had not been noticed. I thanked God in an improvised prayer for having created mud in his infinite and wondrous universe. Suddenly, the silence became more oppressive. An SS officer had come in, and with him, the smell of the angel of death. We stared at his fleshy lips. He harangued us from the center of the barrack. You are in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. 
a pause. He was observing the effect his words had produced. His face remains in my memory to this day. A tall man in his thirties, crime written all over his forehead and his gaze. He looked at us as one would a pack of leprous dogs clinging to life. Remember, he went on, remember it always. Let it be give, graven in your memories. You are in Auschwitz. And Auschwitz is not a convalescent home, it is a concentration camp. Here you must work. If you don't, you will go straight to the chimney, to the crematorium. Work or crematorium, the choice is yours. We had already lived through a lot that night. We thought that nothing could frighten us anymore, but his harsh words sent shivers through us. The word chimney here was not an abstraction. It floated in the air, mingled with the smoke. It was perhaps the only word that had a real meaning in this place. He left the barrack. The capos arrived shouting, all specialists, locksmiths, carpenters, electricians, watchmakers, one step forward. The rest of us were transferred to yet another barrack, this one of stone. We had permission to sit down. A gypsy inmate was in charge. My father suddenly had a colic attack. He got up and asked politely in German, excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? The gypsy stared at him for a long time from head to toe as if he wished to ascertain that the person addressing him was actually a creature of flesh and bone, a human being with a body and a belly. Then, as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. I stood petrified. What had happened to me? My father had just been struck in front of me and I had not even blinked. I had watched and kept silent. Only yesterday, I would have dug my nails into this criminal's flesh. Had I changed that much, so fast? Remorse began to gnaw at me. All I could think was I shall never forgive them for this. My father must have guessed my thoughts because he whispered in my ear, it doesn't hurt. His cheek still bore the red mark of the hand. We feel empathy because we see through the eyes of a young man who is trying to understand the conditions of the world he has fallen into. We have no answers for him as readers because he is the one who knows, even as he shows how he came to know what his older self remembers. It is our job to listen and to acknowledge his fear and his pain. Generating empathy is a central point of Holocaust narratives, regardless of the medium in which we receive them. Just a few days ago, news sources in Orlando, Florida reported that Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation will lend more than 55,000 video testimonies of Holocaust survivors to the Holocaust Museum for Hope and Humanity planned for completion in 2024. The importance of collecting, preserving, and sharing the stories of survivors is certainly behind the USC Shoah Foundation's Institute for Visual History and Education's mission to develop empathy, understanding, and respect through testimony. The intent of the Virtual History Archive is to document testimony interviews with witnesses to pre-genocidal and genocidal violence in current and ongoing conflicts as well as those of the past. Survivors of the Shoah are moral witnesses in the specific way that philosopher Avishai Margalit defines in his 2002 work, The Ethics of Memory. In his introduction, he writes that conveying the sensibility of events from the past that should be landmarks in our collective moral consciousness calls for a special agent of collective memory. Such an agent needs to be invested with special moral authority akin to that of the religious witness or the martyr, unquote. For Martley, this special agent is what he calls a moral witness. His criteria can only be met through one's personal experience with suffering inflicted by an unmitigated evil regime. Witnessing only evil or only suffering is not enough. As we know from efforts to destroy corpses and empty camps before liberation, the Nazis tried to cover up the obscenity of their actions. Margali emphasizes that evil regime, regimes try hard to cover up the enormity of their crimes and the moral witness tries to expose it. Ultimately, writes Margali, the authority of the moral witness has to do with his sincerity. 
but sincerity is only part of it. Authenticity is another. An authentic person is one who gets rid of all his persona or masks and gives expression to his true self, especially in the extreme circumstances of being unprotected by a civilized moral environment. One of the strongest cases for giving expression to one's true self is made in Primo Levi's extraordinary account published in America's Survival in Auschwitz. The actual title in English should be, If This is a Man, which is a more compelling title because it invites the reader to speculate on the humanity that the camps were intent on destroying. The poem that appears between the author's preface and the first chapter directly addresses the reader with the question that the actual title had intended. You who live safe in your warm houses, you who find returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man who works in the mud, who does not know peace, who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of a yes or a no. Consider if this is a woman without hair and without name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold like a frog in winter, Meditate that this came about. I commend these words to you. Carve them in your hearts, at home, in the street, going to bed, rising. Repeat them to your children. Or may your house fall apart. May illness impede you. May your children turn their faces from you. And that poem is a, sort of an inversion of what would be a blessing, but in this case is a curse. Consider if this is a man, this particular line, strengthens the relationship between writer and reader, the witness, and the one he witnesses to. Primo Levi's eloquence runs throughout his text, and there are passages that capture both the feelings and the concrete details of his experience. Levi was an Italian chemist and spent 11 months in Auschwitz. The 10 days he relates shortly before the camp's liberation are grotesque with images of the sick and dying, but beautiful with regard to the way several of the men come together to prepare food and scavenge the remainder of resources in the camp. I'd like to end tonight's lecture not with any conclusion that would attempt to make sense of what these stories mean or why we should read them, but with four instances of Levy's voice, close and confiding, speculative, wondering and profound in its unwavering question of what a man is after living through the camps. The first segment is from the preface. The second is from the essay, The Drowned and the Saved. The third relates the impending winter and the last describes the rain. So this is the author's preface. It was my good fortune to be deported to Auschwitz only in 1944, that is, after the German government had decided, owing to the growing scarcity of labor, to lengthen the average lifespan of the prisoners destined for elimination. It conceded noticeable improvements in the camp routine and temporarily suspended killings at the whim of individuals. As an account of atrocities, therefore, this book of mine adds nothing to what is already known to readers throughout the world on the disturbing question of the death camps. It has not been written in order to formulate new accusations, it should be able rather to furnish documentation for a quiet study of certain aspects of the human mind. Many people, many nations can find themselves, themselves holding more or less wittingly that every stranger is an enemy. For the most part of this conviction lies deep down like some latent infection. It betrays itself only in random disconnected acts and does not lie at the base of a system of reason. But when this does come about, when the unspoken dogma becomes the major premise in a syllogism, then at the end of the chain, there is the logger, and the logger is a camp. Here is the product of a conception of the word carried rigorously to its logical conclusion. So long as the conception subsists, the conclusion remains to threaten us. The story of the death camps should be understood by everyone as a sinister alarm signal. I recognize and ask indulgence for the structural defects of this book. Its origins go back, not indeed in practice, but as an idea and intention to the days in the logger. The need to tell our story to the rest, to make the rest participate in it, 
had taken on for us before our liberation and after the character of an immediate and violent impulse to the point of competing with our other elementary needs. The book has been written to satisfy this need, first and foremost, therefore, as an interior liberation, hence its fragmentary character. The chapters have been written not in logical succession, but in order of urgency. The, book of tight, the work of tightening up is more studied and more recent. It seems to me unnecessary to add that none of the facts are invented. Primo Levi. And then we read his poem, which we've already encountered. So this is from The Drowned and the Saved. What we have so far said, and will say, concerns the ambiguous life of the logger. In our days, many men have lived in this cruel manner, crushed against the bottom, but each for a relatively short period, so that we can perhaps ask ourselves if it is necessary or good to retain any memory of this exceptional human state. To this question, we feel that we have to reply in the affirmative. We are, in fact, convinced that no human experience is without meaning or unworthy of analysis, and that fundamental values, even if they are not positive, can be deduced from this particular world which we are describing. It would also like to consider, we would also like to consider that the logger was preeminently a gigantic biological and social experiment. Thousands of individuals differing in age, condition, origin, language, cu culture, and customs are enclosed within barbed wire. There they live a regular controlled life which is identical for all and inadequate to all needs and which is more rigorous than any experimenter could have set up to establish what is essential and what adventures to the conduct of the human animal and the struggle for life. We do not believe in the most obvious and facile deduction that man is fundamentally brutal, egoistic, and stupid in his conduct once every civilized institution is taken away and that the heflin, the prisoner, is consequently nothing but a man without inhibitions. We believe, rather, that the only conclusion to be drawn is that in the face of driving necessity and physical disabilities, many social habits and instincts are reduced to silence. This is uh, titled October 1944, about the approaching winter. We fought with all our strength to prevent the arrival of winter. We clung to all the warm hours at every desk. We tried to keep the sun and the sky for a little longer, but it was all in vain. Yesterday evening, the sun went down irrevocably between a con behind a confusion of dirty clouds, chimney stacks, and wires, and today it is winter. We know what it means because we were here last winter, and the others will soon learn. It means that in the course of these months, from October till April, seven out of 10 of us will die. Whoever does not die will suffer minute by minute, all day, every day, from the morning before dawn until the distribution of the evening soup. We will have to keep our muscles continually tensed, dance from foot to foot, beat our arms under our shoulders against the cold. We will have to spend bread to acquire gloves and lose hours of sleep to repair them when they become unstitched. As it will no longer be possible to eat in the open, we will have to eat our meals in the hut on our feet. Everyone will be assigned an area of floor as large as a hand, as it is forbidden to rest against the bunks. Wounds will open on everyone's hands, and to be given a bandage will mean waiting every evening for hours on one's feet in the snow and wind. Just as our hunger is not that feeling of missing a meal, so our way of being cold has need of a new word. We say hunger, we say tiredness, fear, pain, we say winter, and they are different things. They are free words created and used by free men who lived in comfort and suffering in their homes. If the loggers had lasted longer, a new harsh language would have been born. And only this language could express what it means to toil the whole day in the wind with the temperature below freezing, wearing only a shirt, underpants, cloth jacket, and trousers, and in one's body nothing but weakness, hunger, and knowledge of the end drawing near. This is the last portion from a section titled Krauss, and it's uh, about the rain. When it rains, we would like to cry. It is November. It has been raining for 10 days now, and the ground is like the bottom of a swamp. Everything made of wood gives out a smell of mushrooms. 
If I could walk 10 steps to the left, I would be under shelter in the shed. A sack to cover my shoulders would be sufficient, or even the prospect of a fire where I could dry myself, or even a dry rag to put between my shirt and my back. Between one movement of the shovel and another, I think about it. And I really believe that to have a dry rag would be a positive happiness. By now it would be impossible to be wetter. I will just have to pay attention to move as little as possible and above all not to make new movements to prevent some other part of my skin coming into unnecessary contact with my soaking icy clothes. It is lucky that it is not windy today. Strange how in some way one always has the impression of being fortunate. How some chance happening, perhaps infinitesimal, stops us crossing the threshold of despair and allows us to live. It is raining, but it is not windy, or else it is raining and it is also windy. But you know that this evening it is your turn for the supplement of soup so that even today you find the strength to reach the evening. Or it is raining, windy, and you have the usual hunger, and then you think that if you really had to, if you really felt nothing in your heart but suffering and tedium, as sometimes happens, when you really seem to lie on the bottom, well, even in that case, at any moment you want, you could always go and touch the electric wire fence or throw yourself under the shunting trains and then it would stop raining. So I encourage you to read each of these memoirs fully, that's just a portion of them, and experience them for yourself.